So to explain a couple of things before we get started on this one, firstly, the videos that I promised from the trips to Washington and New York for street photography, there are no videos simply because the plan was to affix the GoPro to the top of my camera while I shoot. And we did that for one day in Washington before we got completely sick of it. Um, and then New York, we didn't even bother. I have to say, considering the cost of a GoPro and how long they've been doing what they've been doing, they are pretty piss poor cameras. Nothing about using them is fun for me or enjoyable. And the footage never looks like it does in their adverts. Um, so I'll probably put together something of a slideshow. I actually think that that format of me doing videos like that is probably, um, I think it's a bit shoehorned. I don't think I'm that kind of person. I don't think I have that kind of personality. And one of the reasons I'm struggling with producing stuff for YouTube is I just don't really have what is expected in terms of the YouTube uh, personality where you've got to be all, you know, overly hyped and use stupid non-words like, you know, things are lit. <laughs> um, it's all lit everything's lit or keep it 100 um, I don't get that it's because of the emoji so there's an emoji that is 100 yeah and it's meant to be essentially it's saying keep it 100% keep it real keep it authentic oh but because people are so stupid now they they just say the name of the what the emoji is they're looking at so when they when they would type out keep it keep it like a hundred percent because there wasn't a percent on the, on that emoji. They just say, keep it 100. It's like when people say that's flames, they literally mean that is where I would insert a flame emoji to indicate that something is hot. It's just, what? it's just this generation. It makes me feel really old. Well, we are old for one, well, um, you know. but most of the people talking like this are actually older than us and just desperately clinging on to their youth. Whereas we're, steamrolling ahead to our 50s as quickly as we can <laughs> dick <laughs> i'm glad you called me a dick because you're gonna regret that in a second um, oh no and uh what else so there's been a little bit of a break with regards to the podcast and the output of the podcast and so on um i needed some time to sort a few bits and pieces out we've had a few trips abroad like i say um and i now have about five or six people lined up for the next month and a half amazing um to get them rolling again they will be done in bursts i just will not be able to do it continuously with my schedule and the majority of people that i contact about doing them are incredibly vague about what what they're available for so overall it's just an absolute nightmare um, we'll say yesterday I went and saw what I think is the best film I've ever seen. And yeah. we'll probably just say that right now. I was very emotional from that film. I thought it was absolutely beautiful, fantastic, brilliant film, uh, 1917. Everybody needs to go and see that film and go and see it in the cinema. Don't just wait for, do not wait for the Netflix release. No, you need to see it in the cinema. Please go and see it in the cinema. Yeah, it's, it's. So there are several, I mean, obviously it's basically shot in two sort of continuous takes. You can tell there are yeah. points where they have a bit of leeway, but um, there are some shots in that film that I actually realized I was sat there on my own in the cinema with my mouth open, like stunned at how they had pulled certain things off. It's incredible. The story's fantastic. And it's one of the few things in cinema at the moment that it doesn't feel like has some stupid political agenda. It's just there to tell a story and it does it really cleanly. Yeah, it was such an amazing film. The cast were incredible. The sets were incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you felt, I, I felt part of the film and I felt them go through what they what they went through to obviously a certain degree. But you, you it was just so well executed very raw mm. and it had um the majority of the soldiers were very young yeah which was true to what was actually going on i think one of the problems with old war films is that everyone was like 40 and has a, a mustache and is very together and everything mm. seems to be very simple whereas this looks like what it really was which was a bunch of poor bastard teenagers desperately clinging on to sanity and doing something that they didn't even understand the full scope of what they were doing. Yeah. Um, brilliant film. Would highly recommend people go see it. We also saw Lighthouse, I thought uh, was was fantastic. Um, we don't need to go into that too much, but if you're interested in any way in sort of art, cinema, 
Yeah. Um, it's a must see. I'd also recommend seeing that at the cinema, not at home. Um, it's a very strange uh, film. If you if you're used to kind of your standard Marvel bullshit, this will probably throw you out. It doesn't have quite the same cleanness to it. Um, it's a very simple film. Fantastic performances from the two actors, and um, from a photographic point of view, it was shot one to one ratio, I believe, mm-hmm. and uh, black and white. It just it's a stunning film. It's it's a very very beautiful film. Yeah, I agree. See it in the cinema. Don't visually wait. beautiful as as a as a story. I wouldn't call it a beautiful film, but. Um, just the way the way it was shot and everything yeah, yeah. yeah um great presentation and and most importantly they really uh the two actors um Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson really really committed to it the the language the vernacular in it is fantastic and yeah that really surprised me yeah how good it was because like I said to you there were some parts I didn't really understand and I had to kind of guess wait it out and see what <laughs> yeah. they did um yeah no two great films and if you're in any way interested in uh photography or anything like that then definitely go see those um so going back to the comment where you called me a dick really quickly oh um, no so let's let's do a, a quick recap here so back in about july august i started to get the um I wouldn't say the itch because that makes it sound a little bit sort of superficial, but I started to feel the need to change up my camera system. Mm-hmm. Um, I I just felt that I was becoming a bit too formulaic in the way that I was working. And one of the problems was that I had basically used a different version of the same camera for seven years. Um, and I loved it. I love Canon. Um, just a real shame what's happening to that company, but I loved the camera and the lenses and so on. I love the system. Um, you were using Sony at that point. Yes. And I wanted to try something different. Ended up going to Fuji. This has been discussed ad nauseum at this, on this podcast before. Um, and for the last, I don't know, four months, five months, whatever it yeah. is. Um, I don't, I'm not good at maths, but the last, the last few months we have both photographed on Fuji. Yes. Um, specifically for anyone interested in the X-T3, we've had, um, I think we've produced a lot of really cool work. It's been a real, uh, real learning curve because obviously for you as like the resident non-photographer who does photography more than any other photographer, <laughs> um, you have to deal with the focal lengths. Yep. Um, which obviously are different because it's a crop camera and that's really annoying for someone that just wants to keep things very simple and they've only ever known full frame. You'd never photographed anything other than full frame. Um, but, but something's happened. And, um, one thing I will say is on top of, you know, things like my wife calling me a dick, (laughs) Uh, I do have a reputation for the people that don't really know me, but have heard of me of being a bit of an arsehole. Um, and I hope that when people hear this part of the story, they'll realize how much I am not an arsehole in this one particular scenario. <laughs> in many scenarios. So Jamila, yes, my wife, my business partner, my second shooter, my, my everything. Yeah. Please explain what is happening with our cameras. Wow. Number one. Mm-hmm. My Sony's back. I'm so excited. Yeah. Number two. Chris is going to Sony. For weddings. For weddings. But yeah. But still, how exciting is that? Oh my, dude, this is like a complete reversal. This is, we've gone full circle, not reversal. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all about you... We're like, oh, we can do these cameras and then we'll change cameras to from, you went from Canon into Fuji and I followed you. And then we've gone all the way back to Sony. It's like, ha. Uh, well, just, you say uh, we've gone back. I would never was. You were never there. Sony. I've um, gone back and you followed me. Yes. That's actually exactly what's happened <laughs> because you have basically, I don't want to say moaned because that's completely unfair, but you have. Thank you. You have commented on many occasions that the Fuji wasn't doing it in the same way that you felt the Sony was. I think for you, the Sony was a camera that just got out of the way. Yeah. Whereas the Fuji's a lot more tactile. It's a lot more hands-on. Yeah, definitely. Um, And 
I don't want to have to keep dealing with sort of splitting every wedding edit into two halves, into working on your camera and then working on my camera and then matching them. Yeah. So the only logical thing really is for us both to be on the same system and I will be fine on the Sony Mm -hmm. and you were not happy on the Fuji. Is that fair? I think that's, I think that's fair. So basically I'm now shifting all of my wedding gear and my mindset and having to learn another new system for the second time in six months (laughs) because, because you want to change the person, the person, the the non-photographer, the (laughs) non-photographer. That's right. It's because you love me. Yeah. Sadly. it's, (laughs) It's because you love me and I'm your, the other part of your world. Other than Chica. And what, what I would say is that you're a phenomenal photographer. Um, and really, if if I can put you in a position to be comfortable and happy and, and work as best as you can, um, then that's the most important thing because you being better only makes what we end up with from weddings better. So mm. in that sense, it's um, it's a no brainer, but it's mind blowingly annoying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like on top of everything else that life tends to throw at you, I've got I've got someone who picks up a camera for one day a week, maybe two days a week at most, telling me that I'm now changing my entire system around again. So at any point you want to say thank you, I'll leave the floor open. I mean, there was so many thank yous. You have no idea how happy I'm. I'm looking at it and it's it's calling me. So let's for the sake of putting people out their misery. Yeah. You were on an A7R3 before. Yes, which I always forgot the letters and numbers at the end of it. Yeah, you're not. You're. I wouldn't say technical. You're barely literate when it comes to cameras. <laughs> I was on a Sony. That'll Literally do. <laughs> right now, tell me what Fuji we own. Something with an X? They all have an X. Oh, a three? <laughs> there's, there's two different types of Xs with threes. An XT3? There you go. Oh, that was, a, that was a, Considering one's in the room and you're looking at it, it's not bad. Yeah, but to be fair, it I is I know turned... you can't see it from there, but also to be okay. fair, I did say 90 seconds ago what the model was. So yeah, you can't I... really act like you've you know, yeah, decoded there's, something there's just here. so many cameras. <laughs> yeah, there's now one more. Um, so you were on the A7R3, which was beautiful, beautiful images, but heavy files Yes. in terms of storage. Yeah. Um, so you're on the a 7 III which is what I'll be on for it's weddings. Because it's face detect too. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just talk about that for a second because that's going to be epic because we have booked many weddings where there are many puppers. Yeah, but the problem is is that we're not going to stop a wedding halfway through and change the the mode of the face I detect from dog. I think you'll find I may do that. <laughs> Okay. Maybe you'll just stay on dog and I'll stay on people. I did warn and the I'll clients. And I'll contribute about 500 of the 507 photos that get through. I will contribute one of its ear because I'm too excited playing. <laughs> I won't even yeah, take a proper true. picture. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're now, we're now Sony wankers. Um, Woohoo! And I'll continue to use Fuji for the 3291 project. And I think as far as portraits go, that's going to be the interesting area. I don't know what I'm going to do there. I think I'm probably going to end up being on Sony. Oh, um, just for the extra well, resolution. You did do when, when I had the Sony last. You did use it for some portrait shoots and that. So. Yeah, it, it sort of got used in between with the with the Canon. There were yeah. days when the Canon needed a day off and needed to put its <laughs> feet up and put its duvet on. Put its duvet on and watch yeah. a movie. And the Sony did bugger all most of the time, so I made it work. So <laughs> that's true. Um, I will say uh, seventeen hundred quid for the A seven three. Full frame camera, like ridiculous frames per second, all the video bullshit that losers care about. Um, not us. Not us at all. Um, if they could just get a decent, like mid level lens setup, like in terms of price range, then yeah. I think they would be unstoppable. Uh, but 1700 quid for that when you think it's got a higher spec than like the. 5D Mark IV in a lot of areas. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, right, and if, I, I would rather not be changing, but 
needs must. Um, <laughs> wife must. Wife must. <laughs> so that aside, what this podcast is going to be about, considering we've just burnt about 15 minutes talking about complete nonsense, <laughs> um, I thought we're now back underway with weddings. So mm-hmm. we've, we've shot three, four, four, three, four. Four. I've done three, you did four. Yeah, so we've done four this year already, um, which considering we didn't do anything in January is pretty good. Oh crap, we didn't, no. Yeah, yeah it's pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. Literally not at the end of February yet, and we've only been photograph weddings this month and we've just done our fourth. Um, I thought it would actually be quite good. We've had our um we've had our sort of break. We've had a little bit of a, a bit of time to think and reflect on the past year and whatnot. And uh, I get asked a lot of questions through either Instagram or the wedding photography page or just in person generally about getting started in weddings mm-hmm. um, and sort of the sort of good strategies for like not only building your skills and your portfolio, but also getting clients. I would do this podcast on my own. In fact, I did record this on my own a few days ago, um, but I think you bring so much to this that. I had to record it with you because I think I'll have missed quite a lot of points. Thank so you. let's probably split this in half and start off with shooting weddings. Okay. Um, getting started with shooting weddings. I think there's three avenues mm-hmm. you can go down. You've got like you take your camera to a friend wedding or a family member's wedding or whatever. Yeah. Take some pictures without really it being a thing. A thing. And then you get like one or two and then the next time you do it, you get like 10 and you build up a portfolio that way. Then there's second shooting Mm -hmm. where you find an established wedding photographer or what you think is an established wedding photographer. (laughs) That's subjective. (laughs) That's definitely subjective. You shoot with them. um, You assist them more than likely. You do some shooting when you can. Hopefully they're not a complete dick and you're able to take something of a portfolio away from what you're doing and you can build up that way. So you're learning whilst you're building up a portfolio. That's a fantastic way to do it. And then the last way, which is the way that I did it, which is probably the fucking stupidest, which is to go, oh, I'll give weddings a go and then Straight immediately shoot weddings on your own with no idea what even happens at a wedding because no one even likes you enough to invite you to one. So, um, so yeah, because you went in, no knowledge of a wedding. No. Nope. And I went in, no knowledge of weddings or cameras, and I was your assistant. That's true. And I was like, what's a lens? Well, it was, we had a good system though, because the system was, I'll save you from the camera if you save me from people. Yes. We did good. So we did all right. Um, And we've been going for about seven years now, uh, over 300 weddings photographed, I think over 450 booked. Oh, know, yes. Going into the future, there's a lot of stuff still to come. Um, So let's take those three options. Yeah. So there's the first one, the going to a family member's wedding and, uh, or a friend's wedding and taking some pictures. Um, Perfectly admirable way of doing it. Mm-hmm. But uh, the one thing I would say, speaking from experience, I'm, I think, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong here. You will do. Um. I think I'm very open to helping people out get their photos at a wedding, like guests get their photos. Yeah. And um, I'm I'm not someone that gets particularly annoyed by, you know, people that want to take pictures during the group shots or anything like that. But um, there are ways that you can even piss me off with that. Um, just by being inconsiderate, just by being uh, obnoxious with the way that you kind of think that because you want to take pictures, your ones come first. Yeah. Um, something I always say to my clients is that the difference between your family members taking pictures on the day and me taking pictures on the day is that they're using their camera. I'm using yours. Yeah. Um, so when someone's, especially like phones and stuff, but photographers at weddings, you know, how many of the photos that they take are going to be seen by the bride and groom? Maybe a lot, maybe none. Yeah. You know, I think more photos don't get seen than get seen by the bride and groom after their wedding day. I think in most cases that it's just pictures for themselves. Right. That's what I think. Um, so when you're kind of inhibiting the paid person's uh, ability to do their job and, and sort of handicapping the couple from getting the best possible photos they could, when you don't need to, that's where I have a bit of a problem. But, you know, as long as you're respectful, I think that's okay. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. I mean, I didn't obviously learn that way, so no. Um, I think I'd be too 
nervous. I think there are situations where I'm a bit of an introvert, so that wouldn't suit me as well, a even person. Now? No, 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 not so. No, not so much now, but being someone new to that, right. that industry. Right. Um, but I think that if you're going to do it, just maybe tell the photographer that you're doing it. Like yeah, we've, just we've have had a chat. it before yeah. where, you know, we've had a couple of people say it to us. They're like, oh, I'm just like learning. I want to get into it. So are you okay if I just take some pictures? I won't get in your way or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's fine. Like, yeah. you know, it's no problem. As long as you don't interfere with the couple's specific photographs, like you said, it's yeah. their camera. As long as they're getting what they want. Yeah. Like no problem. Like far away. Like I think that that should be encouraged because it shows an openness and shows that not all wedding photographers are dicks, which some can be. Well, it's bitten me in the arse before because I've been so nice. Um, wedding back in, I wouldn't say 2015, maybe 2016. Uh, I remember having a very long conversation with um, a gentleman who turned up in the evening with a lot of, a lot of, heavy gear a lot of um canon stuff um came over and had a chat with me and then he started photographing and he was asking about angles and asking about you know how you use your flash in certain situations and whatnot um and then fast forward to probably late 2018 uh, or mid 2018 i think it was one of our um one of our clients who was already booked messaged me and had said that they'd had an email or a message on Facebook, I think it was, uh, from someone saying that they could undercut me and they could do the job for half the price. And with the smallest amount of investigation, it turned out to be the guy that I had spent a lot of time talking to at that wedding. Um, and wow, I mean, that that it wasn't a pleasant situation, made probably yeah. quite considerably worse by the fact that they were about three times my age and very dishonest with what they were doing. They even yeah. lied to me about it. And then when I showed them screenshots that I'd been sent, then they changed their story again. And yeah. So on that front, I mean, one thing I will say, regardless of which channel you go down, don't be one of those people that looks for a sponsored advert on Facebook and of, of another wedding photographers and tries to siphon business. Cause it just makes you a prick. There is nothing more unprofessional as well. Nothing more unprofessional. I will say as well, I mean, probably speaking more from the point of view of being a person than being a photographer, I would be very sceptical. No, in fact, I would just think you're an asshole if if you had approached me and said, look, I can undercut this other guy. I wouldn't think you're someone I would trust. Yeah. Um, it comes across very desperate and it comes across very dishonest. So not not really things that are great to have when it comes to weddings is, is desperation and dishonesty. Yeah, definitely. Um. But moving on from that, the, the second way to second shoot, I think we've just had a new second shooter on, well, technically gives to be a third one, but you've been working with a new second shooter mm. um, and they're all different. Yeah. Um, and there's ways that you can do a really good job with that. And there's ways you can be really fantastic and guarantee you're going to get a call back and get another opportunity and so on. And then there are ways that you don't. Yeah. I think that, the way to do it is if you want to learn and you are going to second shoot, then come in humble, come in, come in eager, ready to learn. Yep. Um, but listen and pay attention and like really focus on what it is that you're being taught. Um, I found that actually really quite respectful and really helpful when the person who's learning from us is actually engaging yep. and not just going, I'll oh, take the same picture as you. Right. And then takes the same picture and doesn't even understand what it is that I'm doing, yeah. you know, especially like during bride prep, because you've got a little bit more time. So you can kind of, you can kind of put things together. I always, know. do you know what? I think bride prep's a little bit like a bungee jump. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I think if you turn up at a wedding and you go straight into the ceremony and you have to start photographing, like you get there, they arrive, you start photographing. Yeah. That's harder in theory but easier in practice because you don't have time to get nervous yeah yeah that's true whereas bride prep it drags i uh, i want to point out i absolutely love photographing bride prep i have no problem with it but it's a draggy process some stuff happens then doesn't for a while some stuff happens then doesn't for a while yeah and i think you can get in your own head a bit more yeah. If you're new to it, I think you can probably be quite nervous during bride prep. Yeah. And maybe overshoot. Yeah, that's a possibility. And there's 
there's two sides to to that. There's two problems there. One is obviously the enormous amount of files that you're going to end up with. The other is actually that you become quite irritating. Yeah, I can see. If you're that. constantly taking pictures of nothing all the way through, it makes people feel like they haven't got um like a, a breather. Ch- yeah, they haven't got a breather. They haven't got a chance to just relax and settle down and um you build up a lot of trust in between taking photos. I think photographers get paid in most cases for weddings. They get paid for what they do between taking photos. Yeah. Yeah. As well as the photos, you know. I think with um being a second shooter or a third shooter, I think that it's a really good opportunity personally to learn how to photograph weddings. Um I think that because there's zero pressure on you, which is a really good good starting point in some cases i think one thing i will say is that we do things very slightly different and when i say we i mean i um in the i and that's not me disparaging you it's just the way i've got things set up um i've said it to you countless times and i say it to everybody that comes in to learn Mm. um the process i have is that you come in you photograph If there's stuff in there that adds that's supplementary to what I've done, that's great. But the most important thing is that you learn and that you get pictures for yourself. Yeah. And I try and, I try and be as I take all the pressure so that other people can shoot freely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if everyone else acts that way. Having second shot for other people, I can say they, I know at least one wedding where which they, they did, don't. Which they didn't act that way. Where, uh, you know, the I was actually the third shooter and I was kind of expected to keep the boat afloat in, in a lot of cases because they had taken a lot of money and turns out they didn't really know what they were doing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, it's... One thing I will say is, what do you think of... What do you think of people advertising themselves off of a wedding they photographed? for someone else i think as long as it's mutually agreed Mm -hmm. um then i don't see a problem with it right as long as it's mutually agreed and obviously the clients um are aware of that and they're happy with it then me personally i don't see a problem with it but there has to be that agreement in place otherwise it's rude yeah, it's, it's again. It's a bit cheap and a bit. Mm. It's a bit funny. I mean, I, I'm. I don't have a problem with it personally, but I just wondered how you felt. Yeah, um, it's it's the it's the communication, the manners thing. I'm well, the person for manners. That's, that's literally actually it. the main point. I would say of if you want a second shoot, that like the number one thing. Yeah, is how you approach it, and I don't mean how you approach doing it. I mean how you approach wanting to do it. Um, this year, and it's what is the date today? Twenty fifth of February. So we are just about coming up to our second month in. Yes. Yes. And so that's a sixth of the year gone. Christ. Yeah. And we have already had off the top of my head, four requests to second shoot, two on Facebook, one on Instagram, one in person. And none of them have been polite. Yeah. Not a single one of them. Um, to the point where I would probably find at least one of them to be the rudest sort of conversation I've had this year. Yeah. And they're asking a favor. You know, you're asking for a favor and there's no, hi, how are you? I like your work. I'm so-and-so here. You can find my work. Are you looking for someone? I'd really appreciate an opportunity or a chance to have a meeting or whatever. Yeah. It's literally like, can I second shoot? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Yeah. Yeah. It's a manners thing. Yeah. With uh, us, manners. Be polite, you know, do your bit and we will. In the approach, we'll help be you. polite. Yeah. That's the, I think the number one rule. I think I've heard a lot of people say that it's really hard to find second shooter work. It's like, well, if everyone out there is approaching the way that we seem to get approached, and it's no wonder. Lots of established photographers will just turn around and say no because they don't have the time or the energy to waste with it. So well, keep I, th- light. I think, you know, in a very cynical way, you could view it as you're training someone up to take your job or take away your business, right? Yeah. So do you really want to be spoken to like shit by someone and then train them how to take away your job? <laughs> no. Do you know what I mean? It's Yeah. 
it's very, very, it's, it's my dad always used to say about people not being able to see past the end of their own nose. And I think that that's pretty much what it is. So, but I want it. So yeah. therefore I should get it. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Um, so as long as people approach us relatively friendly, that's, you know, polite. That's, that's the first hurdle crossed. And then you are a thousand times more likely to get an opportunity with us than, then if you come in, if you come in rude, I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to be professionally incredibly spiteful yeah. because if you're rude to me, what are you going to be like to clients? What are you going to be like? Yeah. You know, when, when you've got what you want, how much more rude are you going to get? So. Yeah. Oh, if I see the message, I just won't reply to it. No, I take it. Because, uh, <laughs> no, cause I'll be quite rude back. So I just ignore it because I think that's, that's to me, if you haven't got any manners, that's what you get in return from me. You get yeah. nothing off me. Yeah. And then, and then obviously your conduct, if you do get an opportunity to second shoot for someone or you get the opportunity to learn under someone, I'd probably start off with, um, keeping the fucking politics to yourself mm -hmm. on the wedding day. Cause that's been one of the stupidest things I've ever had to deal with is deal with a second shoot and making stupid comments to a guest and then having to deal with the fallout from that. I like, I, I don't mind you know, conversation. I think you should be respect, respectfully professional to the person that's teaching you. If you're stood around all day with a drink in your hand, chatting to people, you're not a second shooter. You're a pain in my ass. Yeah. Um, and you should definitely be, uh, of the mindset that your opinion doesn't matter and no one wants to hear it. Yeah. You know, if I was to second shoot for you and it was your business and I approached you, I wouldn't then turn up and start, taking umbrage of other people's politics or opinion when they're having a chat with their friends and family yeah. at a wedding. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with you. No. And it, and the problem is as well is that then I, you know, the second shooter is a, is an extension of me. So therefore that bad look reflects onto me and I look bad yeah. by proxy. Um, I would definitely suggest approaching people that have a similar style to what you want to end up with. Yeah. Because if you're someone that wants to do sort of highly traditional, break the fourth wall constantly, lots of looking at camera, very traditional type photos, and then you go to a reportage photographer, it's just not going to be worth the time. Yeah. Um, because everything you're going to learn is going to be the opposite of what you want to be doing. And you're probably not going to be contributing too much to that photographer's sort of day and, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Find someone that suits your style. Find someone whose work you really like. Find someone who actually... If they were photographing your wedding, like you would want them to photograph your wedding is what I'm getting at. Like yeah. that kind of mindset, because then the passion is there, the emotion is there and that willfulness to learn is there, Yeah, you know, and I think you'll get much further with that and you'll actually learn things a lot quicker. And then if your intention is then to go on and shoot for yourself, you're a lot more willing, prepared, a lot more confident to be able to do that if you've had that enjoyment in the whole build up process. Yeah rather than just kind of do something like you said, that's completely opposite. And then actually you're not really going to get anywhere and you're probably not going to enjoy it. No. Um, and, and then you won't attract the same, this, this, the, the type of clients that you want to attract. Yeah. And, and you know what, this is, this is like a really important point is that one of the things that comes up quite a lot is that people say, Oh, you know, I was just starting out and you take whatever job you can. Don't just don't, don't do that. No, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Because Absolute. I don't know what the correct way of saying this, but sod's law mm -hmm. is that you'll do one job that is the complete opposite of the stuff that you want to be doing. And that'll be the only type of client that will find you. Yeah. That's just sod's law. Yeah. It's, it's so counterproductive because what will happen is then you'll get a, a revenue stream from that, that you don't want, but you keep contributing to because it's contributing to your, to your bank balance. And eventually that's where you are. Yeah. You, it's very hard to move away from it once you're in it. Yeah, definitely. Um, with regards to equipment, like gear, minimal, you say? Yeah, minimal. I, you don't need all the bells and whistles. No. To be quite honest with you. No. You need a wide, you need a long, you need a good camera that can, I would say the one that can function in low light. Yeah. It, it, the full Full crop, full frame, full frame, sorry, yeah. full frame and crop to me as a person 
I actually don't really notice the difference. Like it, I know people get offended by that, but me, it doesn't matter to me, but if it does to you pick which one, Yeah. but you need low light or wide, you need long, um, uh, spare batteries and don't be charging your batteries whilst you're at a wedding. Just That's have them ready to go. The passion I just saw in yeah. your eyes then. <laughs> that is a thing. Me and you, every time we see it, oh. we just think, fucking hell, sort yourself out. It just looks so unprofessional. you got like, you know, videographer or another photographer or whatever with their batteries plugged in behind the bar or worse still, like by a table. Yeah. You know, it just, it's a really bad look. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, the, the other things I say is like dual card it. So you've got a backup and shoot in raw. I think those are kind of the, yeah. the simple. I've only ever known one photographer that didn't shoot in raw. <laughs> she quickly weddings. changed and after everybody latched yeah, onto it. She brought that up at a workshop and everyone went nuts. She was like, I'm sorry, don't yell at me. Yeah. And then, yeah, but her work's beautiful. It's great work. Yeah, lovely. Um, but obviously it's just, it's like I can, I can land on my feet from a somersault off a cliff 99 times out of a hundred. So I'd want, I'd want the net for the one out of a hundred times. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? No matter how good you are, I'd still want the safety yeah. net. Yeah. But that day she changed. Flick it to raw. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, she did. Okay. Yeah, she did. And I I, I believe just has continued shooting in raw since. But um, yeah, that's like, those are the things I'd say, like, keep it simple. You don't like, you don't need the bells and whistles, you know, you don't need fancy flashes. I mean, maybe a flash is one of those things you should add to, uh, your collection, like when you're starting off your you weddings, should definitely have something, um, yeah. for, you know, cake cuts and dances. Cause they're always in pitch black or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, in, but I don't think in you dinge. in dinge, yeah. so with dank rooms mm. with, with stuff stuck behind the cake and yeah. But I don't think you really, I don't think you really need to worry about anything more than that when you're getting started. Obviously add to your collection as it goes on, change things up, upgrade stuff, whatever. Well, that's when you're, you're more prolific Mm. on your, in your own right. But Mm. I think one, one thing I, I get, I genuinely get frustrated with, and I think it's pretty much across the board is just bags upon bags being in the way Yeah, and people kind of, I try my best to leave a room to sort my bag out. So say- um, bride and groom and that everyone's got in for the meal mm-hmm. and we're we're done we're going to go and have our break take your bag out the room deal yeah. with your bag in a separate room don't don't stand in that room making it look untidy sorting your bag out that's one thing that drives me mad yeah um and the more stuff you have the more crap you're going to leave laying around yeah. and and it might not be crap to you but it's crap to everyone else that's you know in the way of the wedding so like you said yeah you don't need mass amounts of stuff Take it with you somewhere else. It's like a restaurant. If you saw the chaos that was happening in the kitchen, you'd be a lot less enthusiastic about the meal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But to see this like air of calm and confidence and then be presented with the food is is much better. Yeah. And you can you can trick yourself into thinking that everyone in the kitchen is loving each other <laughs> and not throwing <laughs> knives at each other. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I'd say to start with. Keep it simple. Now, there is a... To shift gears to the people shooting it on their own while we're just going down those three channels. If you're going to go and sort of just go in straight at the deep end like I did and just put your feet to the fire and see what happens, there's um, a lot of wedding fluff online Mm -hmm. in photographic sense on YouTube and in like F-stoppers type bullshit where there's like, you know, you've got to have two of everything and they mean literally two of everything. And it's like, yeah. well, financially, that makes no fucking sense if you're just starting. Um, you should have, you know, an adequate backup idea. Yeah. But you can't have two of everything if you're just starting out. You know, oh, I'm just going to drop 10, 15,000 on gear for a job that I'm going to do for free to see if I like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's just not, it's not um, economic, not economically sound at all. Um, But there is this one constant that drove me mad when i first started which was the holy trinity mm-hmm. um and i think if it didn't have a like a, and i'm fucking air quoting hard here but if it didn't have like a cool name <laughs> people wouldn't even take this as serious advice they would be able to see the stupidity in this but essentially the idea is that you have three zoom lenses that yeah. cover you from about between 11 and 16 mil all the way up to 200 mil yeah. So you'd have, say, for example, an 11 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 to 200. Yeah. And that way, anything that happens inside of those focal range, inside of those focal lenses is, is achievable. Yeah. Bollocks. 
Yeah. Bollocks. There's no point in in the 300 odd weddings that we photographed. You get people that um, obviously have their their feedback and, you know, you're going to deal with in any service industry, you're going to deal with a certain amount of people that think you could have done stuff differently. But I've never, ever had the complaint that like, I like this photo, but I wish it was at 37 millimeters. <laughs> yeah, you, know you won't I mean? get that. No. So we, you don't have to shoot primes, but you also don't have to cover every single possible focal length in the same way that like it, to me, it's got a real scorching the earth vibe to it, <laughs> where it's like, it just feels a little bit overkill. Yeah. I think a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, support articles online or in magazines or, or anything that are there to assist you to get into photography will tell you the most expensive way to get into photography. Yeah. And they lead you down, um, a very untruthful path, a sponsored path, a sponsored path. Yeah. Um, to get you to kind of buy into a lot of like the bells and whistles again that you don't really need. Yeah. Like, you don't have to have the Holy Trinity at any point in wedding photography. No, if, I think I've had it for what, one, I had it for one wedding. Did you know that? This one wedding. vaguely rings a bell. I, really rent, I rented it because I thought I had to. Um, one of my first weddings and um, my bag weighed a fucking ton. <laughs> yeah. I came back with really bad shoulder ache and I'd used, so I, I, so what I rented was a 16 to 35, a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200. But because I was already renting all of that, I was like, oh, I'm quite fancy trying out the 85 mil. <laughs> so I rented out the you 85 mil 1.2 yeah. and I rented the, I think the 50 mil 1.2. And all I used all day was the 24 to 70 and the 85. Yeah. Um, the, the 70 to 200, I put on the camera, took like three photos and then was like, it's overkill and went to something else. And it's, it's not that the 70 to 200 is a bad lens. It's just, mm. it wasn't working for what I was doing. Yeah. Um, but I didn't find at any point in myself going, Oh, but what if they need something at 104? Yeah. You know, it's, it's to me. I think lenses are an extension of yourself. <sighs> right. I think so. You really need the lenses that you feel most comfortable shooting with. If you're a prime shooter, then you're very comfortable physically yourself moving in and out of situations, yeah. you know, getting closer to the subject, um, or moving further away. Um, and there's no problem with that. That kind of suits your style. Um, for zooms, you can stand in one spot and you can, you just move your eyesight. Like it zooms in, zooms out. So right. you don't. So I think it is really dependent on, it's dependent on what gear you're comfortable with and what you are, how you are as a person is, and neither one is better than the other. It's just what suits you. So I think pick what suits you and go with that rather than go with what everyone is telling you you have to have. I mean, there's things that we would, we would recommend if somebody asked us, but I would never turn around to anybody and say, you have to have this and this no. and make it like a must. I would say I would, I wouldn't go to a wedding without the following because I love those lenses for these reasons, but that's an opinion. You should go with what you're most comfortable with and what you're going to enjoy shooting with and what works for what it is that you're photographing. Yeah. So I had a conversation a while back with someone in the second shot with us who was asking about this. And one thing I noticed fairly quickly in the conversation was that they were extremely defensive about the opposite point of view. So they were a zoomy zoom and I'm a prime. <laughs> and they asked about the use of prime and they asked about, uh, do I ever feel like I'm out of range? Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm too close or I'm too, too far. Yeah. Um, and how do I deal with that and so on and so forth. And and I, I wouldn't say I pushed back at all because I just explained myself. Yeah. Um, but what, one thing I said to them was, you know, how often do you find yourself at 70 mil on the 24 or 70 or at 24 mil? Yeah. One or the other. How often do you find yourself at 70 mil or 200 mil? not just in the middle. Yeah. Um, and is having that much of a focal range worth giving up like two stops of light in terms of aperture, mm -hmm. um, especially for weddings in England, which generally take place in pitch black rooms. <laughs> yeah. Is it worth it? And they were very defensive about me calling that out. And, and one thing I would say is, is um, there's a, uh, 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 there's a nice hockey team, Jamila, called the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. I did not know this. 
And um, back in the mid 2000s, they had a goaltender who was one of my favorite goaltenders to ever play. I'm a big ice hockey fan. A goaltender called Jean Sebastian Giguere. Uh, Jiggy. Love that name. And uh, Jiggy uh, was on the playoff run of a lifetime. And basically, I think he shut out a team pretty much either every night or every other night. He was damn near impossible. He was a brick wall in goal. And there was a save he made where he's moved over to the left of the goal and the puck gets thrown across the middle and he just sticks a leg out and the bottom of his skate, like the tip of his skate, catches the puck and stops it going in. And it's a big highlight reel. And there was a Mm -hmm. quote um, from the commentator, a soundbite, which was that he was a purple haze of goaltending madness. (laughs) One of my favourite quotes. It's a nice quote. And they asked him afterwards about the the save about how incredible was the save how did you see it from your point of view and he said if you see me do something athletic or spectacular it means i probably did something stupid just before it to put myself in the position to need to do that (laughs) right yeah now when i was asked about the use of zooms and how primes leave you short in a pinch you know at a moment's Mm. notice i said if i'm at a in a position where I would have needed a zoom to get the shot, I'm not doing my job as a photographer to begin with. I think that's fair. Stuff happens out of nowhere. That's, that's a given. Yeah. But your job as a photographer isn't necessarily to just be able to bite in on every single possible angle of everything. It's sometimes about being able to read the situation and be in the right place. And it takes time to learn that skill. It takes time to practice it and tune it yeah and we see a lot of times photographers not do it Mm -hmm. um and you know very quickly when i'm not happy about people not doing it yes um i won't i won't tell people off or anything like that but i'll point out this should have been a very obvious yeah thing and sometimes maybe i'm being a little bit unfair because it's only obvious to me because i do 60 to 70 weddings a year yeah Um, but my point is is that if you feel like you need a zoom to save you Maybe the problem is the fact that you feel like you need to be saved. Well, yeah. How's that? Is that bad? Am I mean? <laughs> no, you're not mean. It's your opinion on it. You're not stating this is this no, it's is not fact. fact. This yeah. is not law. This is your opinion on it. And that's the um that's the point people take it or leave it at the end of the day. Yeah. That's that's how I would that's how I would see it myself. Yeah. And that's all that matters. Is yeah. you don't have to you don't have to buy into my philosophy but that is my philosophy okay so in terms of like the photographic stuff that they you know they've got roughly all the gear they need Mm -hmm. not more than they need yeah um whichever route they've gone down something i would say to everybody that wants to photograph a wedding where they are considered the photographer Mm -hmm. now they might not be getting paid but they are the photographer. So your brother-in-law wants you to photograph a wedding or or whatever. Yeah. Contract. Yes, 100%. Even if you're not being paid? Yes, 100%. Yep. Absolutely 100% because most importantly, first and foremost, is to protect yourself and to protect the client. You should never go into any situation like that where – there is a level of expectation from the client to you to produce something. Mm-hmm. You need to make sure that you are protected from front to back. You need to make sure the client is protected from front to back. Yeah. Um, and also it sets out reasonable expectations. Um, and also to for both parties to realize that you are also humans. You know, contracts are, always seem like quite scary things, especially yep. when they're like six, seven pages long and they're itemized and stuff. People do get a bit worried. They get worried about the jargon, jar, jargon that's in there. And you don't need to worry about any of that stuff. It's there to protect you, keep you safe. It's there to help you. Um, and it's also there if anything does go wrong, you've got a backup. Yeah. You know, you've got that support network in place. Um, and as wedding photographers, it allows the clients to understand what it is that they're getting out of you. Yeah. There is that level of expectation and you need I think, to make I think that's the key word. The expectation. Yeah. I think a contract, if, especially if there's no money, people would think a contract's not worthwhile. Yeah. But a contract is just about defining expectations in writing. 
Yeah. So that you're not in a position where someone says, well, I thought. Yes. And then you are at, you're at the whim of their reckon. Yes. Because I reckon I should have had such and such. I reckon you should do such and such. Yeah. Um, And vice versa. Yeah. Because I mean, there's a thing, there's a phrase in the field that I work in. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. Yeah. And it's very similar with this. If you tell your wedding clients, um, if it is throwing, if it is chucking down with rain, we will not go outside to photograph your group shots. Say that's a, a, a line in your contract. Yeah. If you don't have that yeah. and you get to a wedding and you don't photograph that and the couple are like, well, it, like we, we need to go outside. Like, why are we not outside photographing these group shots? And you'll say, oh no, well, I, I didn't because it was raining. That's not good enough. Mm-hmm. Whereas if there is already that expectation out there, couples know. And yep. then vice versa, you also, there are expectations for the couples. Like they have to give you timings or, you know, address details and things like that. So it's expectations both ways to cover both of you. Um, but they are the most important thing. And if you're just photographing them for a friend or a family member and it's not paid, you don't have to get out the most complex contract in the no. world. You can have it very, very, very simple, but you just need to put in there what you feel is important. A contract at the end of the day can be one page, it can be 10 pages. It, it's just purely dependent on what you want it for. But I, I strongly advise that anyone yeah. who's doing it gets one. I think I've photographed two weddings without a contract. Ever. Yes. That was the very first two that you photographed. No, it wasn't. The first one that I photographed and your sister's. Oh, I forgot about hers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you forget about her wedding. You forgot no. I photographed it, but. I forgot. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. Um, but those are the only two. And I would have said, really, in hindsight, I should have had one for your sister's just for the sake of having it. Yeah. Just for the sake of being airtight. Not that I would accuse your sister of anything, but more just to be airtight. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly family and friends aren't family and friends when they're not getting what they want. Oh, yeah. In just life in general, we hear this from almost every single family that we interact with through weddings. So there's there's some kind of, you know, bullshit going on between one person and the other over what is essentially nothing but turns into a huge thing, mostly because it's family and friends. Yeah. Whereas in our situation with my sister and her husband, we're very lucky that they just... They just liked you, what you did, and it was, can you, I was can free. you photograph? And you, yeah, <laughs> you were free. The, same, the same reason that you married me was I was free. But that's not the reason why I married you. You weren't completely free. That's not fair. I wasn't completely free. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Um, the other thing I would, I would personally recommend is something that we've worked really hard at Um, over the years to sort of refine and change up and make sure that it kind of covers as much as we can is having some kind of consultation sheet. Mm. So you just know timings, you know, numbers, you know, the schedule without having to sort of, you know, hit and hope. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, we just used to, I think the first two years, a year and a half, maybe um, we, when we met clients, when we spoke to them on the phone, we just, hand wrote notes in a book. Yeah, it wasn't good. And that was it. And it was kind of all over the place because especially when you're when you're talking to people, when you're just chatting away, you just make notes sort of all over the page and stuff gets a little bit lost in translation. So it's then kind of and then we were then going back and I was taking out the key bits and then rewriting them, but then getting a bit confused about stuff. Yeah, I so. think what, what we also did was the transition into having a consultation sort of note, like as in a, a set table idea of all of the things we needed to know was that we would just write bullshit down on a piece of paper and then try and translate that over onto a form instead of just doing the form at the time which was really stupid and we did that for way too long and especially considering I have the writing of a slightly brain damaged doctor it was just not a good idea because there was times that you would come in firstly I would shorthand bridesmaids to BM and best man to BM that was not a good system. That was not a good system, no. Um, but I, you would bring me notes that I had made five seconds after I'd made them and said, what does that say? And I'd be like, I have no idea. <laughs> so that that needs, you know, you need to make sure you have something that just tells you the times of the key events. So what time you're getting to prep, what time the ceremony is, mm-hmm. what time they sit down to eat, when are the speeches, 
when's the cake cut when's the dance that's yeah. the first part yeah. total number of people that's going to be there isn't really important but it it can be if you're going to do a full group picture so you have a rough idea of how many people you're dealing with because that way when you're looking for the space to do it in yeah that's what you need to be thinking and the time it would take to get them together especially if you're new yeah because new people tend to be quiet yeah you might not be as confident at rounding up 110 people no and then or shouting from a dj's balcony <laughs> like i was um you also it's a good idea to have an idea of how many bridesmaids how many groomsmen you've got and who you have in the way of parents is always a good a good one to have in terms of the bride and groom's parents step parents and yeah. grandparents yeah that's important for us because you kind of know the dynamic you're dealing with when it comes to putting together family groups. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit personal, but it's always good to know. We've had one particular situation I can think of when uh, I was told very early on in the day to call uh, one gentleman dad because he was the father of the bride. And then midway through the group shots, a guy went mental at me because he was the real father of the yeah. bride. And this other guy was the stepdad and, and it's you like, don't you, really want to cause upset. Well, no, so I'm not. I'm not Jeremy Kyle. Mm. I'm not there to administer the the lie detectors and the DNA test to find out who's who. It's not really my problem, to an extent. And you shouldn't be offended by me doing what I was told to do. But people will be. So, it's but they best will be. be. So you just cover your prepared. ass as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. It's also good to know what's important about the day, which I know sounds like a really stupidly obvious question, but it, it it's actually not. It's quite a valid question. Um, and also if there is anybody else that's particularly important about the day. Or not. I actually find that's quite a good yeah. question to ask who isn't important. Is there anyone that we need to be on the lookout for that maybe thinks it's more and more of their day and the bride's, you know, the groom's not we happy We often get, that. oh, it's one of our sisters. It's quite often a sister. <laughs> Sometimes a brother. We've had a couple of really funny brothers. Yeah, that's true. We have. Yeah. Um, we had a, I remember a wedding late summer last year where um, they had gone in for the meal. I'm sat outside to eat, which was quite nice. And they're sort of finishing up their meal. They're about to start the speeches and you get the few stragglers that come out for a smoke. And one of the stragglers was a brother of the groom. And he came outside and um, was talking to his mum, so the mum of the groom. And he said, um, this is exactly why I didn't want to be a groomsman. And he's not a groomsman, just to clarify. This is exactly why I didn't I want to be a groomsman. This. And the mum was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I don't want to do unpaid labour. And I, I honestly, I laughed because I thought there's no way that that was a serious statement. And he was like, Being I, serious. I'm, yeah, he was like, I'm, I, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to like, push people around and tell them where to go and give a speech for free. <laughs> like Such a weird thought process. Yeah, like, uh, would you be the best man at my wedding? What's the pay like? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you do get the odd ones. You also get like sometimes just a random auntie that likes to ruin first dances at two separate weddings that we've been to that we didn't think were related. That was quite funny. So weird, that one. So weird. Um. Yeah, you just it's good to know who's maybe going to be a challenge. Mm. And the bride and groom usually know who that is. Like right now, I could tell you who was the challenge at our wedding. Yeah. So you can do that. Yeah. Um, but it's to know, also to get to know the clients a little bit. A little bit about them, a little yeah. bit about the personality. Um, because then when you get to the day, you have to be aware that when you're doing the consultation, it's just you and them. Yeah. When you get to the day, it's you, them and everyone else. Yeah. So um, you need to be able to... Make people feel comfortable that you're there, especially during prep, because it's a, a, a lot uh, smaller vicinity. So you need to be able to make sure that people feel comfortable with you being there, that you're able to engage in other people's conversations should the need arise. I'm not saying intervene. On that all front, of them. so I have a trick, and I don't think you've picked up on it yet, because I'm not usually the most outgoing person. It takes yeah. me a long. It's taken me a long time with weddings, really, to be outgoing. Um, I I much prefer. Me and you, me and you and Chica, or just me. Yeah. I'm very much, I'm a bit of a loner. I quite like being a loner. Um, not great in huge groups, especially if there's people I know. Um, but something that I now do quite regularly, and I'm a bit unfortunately going to have to give this away, is I tell people they look like someone. Mm -hmm. So eh, most people look the same. Let's be <laughs> honest, like... 
you know, if you have a blonde person, you can make a comparison to a famous blonde person. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. If you have even a loose resemblance to someone famous, it's a conversation starter. Yeah. And it's also a good, completely pointless conversation that you can return to over the course of the day. So there might be a bridesmaid and I'll say, oh, you really look like, you know, Jessica Chastain. And then she'll be like, who's that? And then you like Google it. You're like, you look like her. And like, oh my God, I look like her. <laughs> and then like over the course of the day, when you don't have anything to say, but you're dealing with the bridesmaids or anything, you, you have like a thing you can return to to talk it's about. It's a fallback, isn't there? Yeah. And I made the mistake early on of using other weddings as the conversation piece. So, oh, well, I was at this one wedding where such and such happened. And the problem with that is, is that you run a pretty decent risk that someone else has had a similar situation or has a yeah. different opinion to how that would turn out. Yeah. And then you can almost have a bit of a conflict in in opinions and morals and it's not really worth it. Yeah. Whereas just telling someone, oh my God, you kind of look like so-and-so. And they're like, oh, do I? And then yeah. that's the, oh, no, I don't. No, oh, I'm seeing it. Yeah. My comments are usually, unless like the bride and the bride apart are already really quite chatty, my comments are usually around the style of the dress or the music that's playing um, during prep. Yeah. Because quite often the people that we photograph are sort of around our age, give or take a few years. So yeah, my the music. Age. <laughs> my age because I'm younger. Um, <coughs> God. The music. It's a really that, bad time to have a little cough there and <coughs> seem like you're getting old, you know. Seriously. A bit long so, in the tooth. <gasps> So mean. Um, but yeah, but like the, like the music's a good one. Oh, you know, like the other day, the music that was playing was music that, you know, I listened to when I was a, a teenager and you're like, oh, this is actually a really good playlist. Is that the music that was on during the silent film era? <laughs> you were <laughs> such a dick on film tonight. Um, but yeah, so there's loads of different ways to start a conversation, you know, um, generally just asking how they are. Like, how are you feeling today? Are you nervous? You know, do you feel like into this? You know, don't worry about this. You know, just... Um, just make them feel comfortable, yeah. you know? And I think that that it's... it. Don't talk about photography. Yeah, no, don't. They don't care. No. They do not give a shit. I was actually going to use a 40 mil for this, but I'm going to switch to the 85 for the compression. Yeah. No one cares. No, no one gives a shit. No one cares. And anyone that does care, it's not going to be a fun conversation. Like, yeah. Right now, me and you both know about enough about photography that I could say... You know, lately I've been really pursuing this idea of I do my wide shots with a longer lens and my sort of my close up stuff with a wider lens. And like you would go, that's nice, dear. <laughs> and that would be the end of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I know what that means. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it's it's boring. Don't don't just talk about, don't talk about photography, uh, like actual photography on the wedding day. Don't talk about politics. No, don't talk about politics. Um, but it's just, you know, crack jokes, just be a human being. Don't be a, don't there was, be weird and antisocial. There was a moment at the, uh, the second to last wedding we did last year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know where, where I'm talking about. Yeah. And, um, someone in the room when everything was going smoothly, everything was lovely. Someone just went, well, which way did you vote in the referendum? And I banged my head against the wall <laughs> in like, a, I tried to do it like a kind of like face palm, but it turned out the wall was fairly hollow and it made the most booming sounds. <laughs> so it was just this complete underline of hatred towards the conversation. <laughs> and then everyone turns around, looks at me and bursts out laughing. It was completely unintentional. Um, but yeah, don't talk politics. Don't talk photography. Just, just talk like you're a human being. Tr tricks well, them into thinking you're but don't overly talk. You don't need to have ample amount of conversation. No, it's, I'll tell you one thing I think I'm very good at. Maybe, maybe I've had one wedding where they've disagreed with me on this, but I, I don't know if I'm going to go down that route. But, um, <laughs> it's that I'm, I think I'm pretty good at selecting my moments. Yes. Like overall, as you just face plant into the microphone <laughs> there, which I don't know if that's going to show up, but if it didn't, just to clarify, Jamila just headbutted the microphone with her nose. Um, <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah, it's just picking your moments. So, like, you you don't talk over people mm. when the conversation in the room in bride prep, especially, is flowing. Don't get involved. Yeah, if you're brought in, you're brought in, but don't get involved. But if there's lots of gaps, gaps generally mean nerves. Yeah, 
So you can just have a conversation. I also, one thing I would say is that don't ask, are you nervous? I see, I do. Well, I don't think you ask, are you nervous to someone who is very clearly nervous? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, I don't do that. If there's like a dead spot in the conversation and the bride's just sat there, you can usually read a bride's mood by her hands. Yeah. And then if she's there like clawing the makeup chair or she's like, like desperately like wringing her fingers or like, you know, like fucking prayer position or whatever. Don't then go be nervous. <laughs> it's like, well, I am I now. Like it, it doesn't help. I wasn't before. My, my current thing to save people from being nervous is when they're like, when they, they are clearly and they are outspokenly very nervous and it's getting like, it's getting to nut cutting time. Mm. I'll say to them, do me a favor. Think of the worst name someone could give a cat. Like what is the most irritating name someone could give a cat? So like, for example, for me, I think Paul, if you, if you got a kitten, like a cute little kitten and you called it Paul, I'd hate you. Such a lame name for a kitten. It's like, why even have a pet? You're so boring. Why even have a pet? And you see how you've been instantly distracted by this whole conversation. Yeah. It works perfectly. Yeah. And it's like non-destructive. No one's going to get offended by it. Yeah. Unless they've got a cat called Paul, in which case they can fuck off. But (laughs) He means that he's sorry if he offended you. No. (laughs) No, not if you've got a cat named Paul. I'm not sorry in the slightest. (laughs) Um, All right. We, we've we've done pretty well here. This is a pretty long one, I have to say. This is we're covering a lot of ground. Um, one question I do have is uh, shot lists is something that comes up a lot. People say you should have a shot list on you. Yeah. And when I say a shot list, I mean like flowers, picture of the dress. I would say shoes. Please, like if you're to be married, do me a favor. Don't pull those lists off of Instagram. H- who? Hang on. Who, which side are you talking here? Are you talking about the brides? Yeah, I'm, t- well, I'm talking to photographers here. Yeah, I know. I'm but- saying about photographers having a list on them. Oh, I there's, see there's a, what okay, you mean. Okay, so I didn't explain okay, myself sorry, well. Sorry, sorry. There is a thing with like f-stopper type bullshit articles and petter pics and whatnot, stuff that you would never read in a million years. Oh, okay. Where they're like, oh, to be prepared for a wedding, you should have a list of all the photos you need to take. So it would be like, get a picture of the room. Get a picture of the dad, get a picture of the shoes, get a picture of the... And I, to me, if you need to be told all of that, there's a problem. Probably not quite ready. No. You're not quite ready. No, not at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay, sorry. I misunderstood yeah. what you said earlier. Um, yeah. No, no, no. That no, What you're saying makes sense. Yeah, yeah. D- yeah, you don't really need a shot list like that. The only kind of shot list you need is if it's like any formal group shots. That's really it. You don't need... Yeah, I mean, if they have anything in particular, like, oh, I really want to get... A, like, can you get a portrait of my nan while she's there? Yeah. Something like that. That's fine. But, like, if you need to be told to take a picture of the wedding cake... <laughs> take a picture of the first kiss... Yeah, like it's it's it should be a little bit self-explanatory, I think, in that sense. And it would just be one extra thing that you're kind of fumbling with on the day. Yeah. And I think if you have a list, you're probably more likely to fuck it up than if you don't. Yeah. Maybe that's a bit arrogant on my part, but I, I genuinely think if if you gave me a list of everything that I had to photograph, like a checklist, mm-hmm. I would get so in my head about the checklist, I would probably miss certain things. Yeah. But I think in it, I think the term wedding photographer would be pretty descriptive that you would need to photograph things like the cake, the kiss, the rings being put on, the walk down the aisle, uh, the speeches, the yeah. first dance, yeah. the couple shots. They're kind of all a given. It kind of falls under the title wedding photographer. Otherwise, it, what are you taking photos of? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think it, 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 it's in the description. I do remember a story about a portrait photographer who got paid something daft, like 2,200 quid to shoot their first wedding. They'd never shot a wedding before. Wow. But they were like, the bride was one of their models. We actually, okay, so really quickly, for the sake of people listening to this, here's a fun little mysterious fact for you. Me and Jamila recorded a podcast about two weeks ago that will never see the light of day. Oh, yeah. Because we covered a subject that I got so pissed off about, rightly so. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I know you agree with me, but even if you didn't, you're wrong. Um, oh, I, I got you. so angry about that I didn't think it was worth putting on on the podcast because it was so 
it was such a bummer. Yeah. It was a real downer of a podcast in a sense. Um, very, very interesting story, but something that I've really got to find a way to, you know, work into a podcast <laughs> without it being a downer. Um, but what was I saying? <laughs> I've completely lost track of Oh, this... Okay, so that person, <laughs> that story... <laughs> shut up. That person... How many like how many, how many edits am I going to have to do on this? Because of your coughing and moving around and your <laughs> racist joke. I'm listening to you. Right. Have some respect. I spent a thousand pounds on the camera today. Um, So the same person that did this wedding that I'm about to talk about... Yeah. ...is also the person from that story. So really? we have two interesting stories about this. Uh, so this person's a portrait photographer, and I say that very loosely, um, who photographs, um, let's just go with models. I'm not going to go down the disparaging route. And they were paid about, 20, I think it's about 2,200 quid. That's a number that's sticking out in my head. And I'm usually pretty good with numbers um, to photograph a wedding. They'd never photographed a wedding before. Yeah. And I believe that they delivered something like seven photos from a full day. Wow. And it was like, I saw a few of them. It was like a picture of the bride and bride walking into the church, like four or five couple photos and a group photo. And I think like a couple of pictures, maybe a picture of the cake. Like that was it. And, um, the, the obviously the family's kicked off because, the fuck, Rightly so. Where the fuck all the photos? Yeah. And the photographer was like, I hand over what I think best sort of works. Not, I don't, if I don't think a photo's worked, it doesn't like matter right. about the moment. It's about whether or not the photo worked. Um, I always thought that was really funny. Like, <laughs> I, I can't imagine having that conversation. Whether they're like, is there any pictures of like the first kiss? And you're like, yeah, the rim light just wasn't working the way I wanted it to. So <laughs> it's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Like God. to have the photos and say, you can't have them because I, I don't think they're good enough. Yeah. They're not good enough for my name yeah. is a bit of a scary thing. You have to give your money back, surely. Yeah. Well, you, you know, any respectful human being would. Yeah. Well, we know from our forbidden podcast that it's not this person is not worth anything <laughs> as a human being. Um. All right. So very quickly then in terms of starting a business let's say you've got a couple of weddings well this is the home stretch now Jamila. i can see you're fading no no um as far as starting a photography business obviously we talked about contracts we yep. don't need to cover that um and talked about like consultation sheets and whatnot but once they've got a couple of Im a couple of weddings under their belt they've got a you know a, a decent set of images from a culmination of all of those weddings mm -hmm. um the best way to sort of generate business from there would be facebook 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 is an amazing business tool Facebook. Facebook. yeah <laughs> it is a very good business tool it's a very very good business tool and it's very good if you're not super business minded either right like you don't have to have um taken a degree in business to understand and to actually set up a business online um it's quite simple, easy to use, and it has a lot of reach to people as well. Um, the advertising on it is really simple to, to run and you can get a lot of reach doing their advertising. The fees for advertising are not astronomical. So um, they're a huge benefit. Um, and also it's a really good way to review, to get reviews and for people to see your reviews and to see how you're doing. Um, and also a fantastic way to make immediate contact with that person. Yeah. Because obviously I, when, when we were kids, the internet wasn't as popular as what it is now. It's not used. We didn't have things like social media when we were kids. You had MSN so, messenger. <coughs> yeah, we had MSN messenger. And if someone wanted to use the phone, we didn't have MSN <laughs> messenger didn't anymore. We didn't have MSN messenger. We had to time it really well. Yeah. Um, but uh, then it was... Fucking kids don't know how easy they got They it. really don't, do they? God, now we're old. It's all your fault. You just keep saying the old thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, then, and I remember when my aunt got married, I think I was 
eight or nine. Mm-hmm. So she found her photographer looking through the yellow pages. Yeah. Which you know, doesn't exist anymore. Which doesn't exist anymore. Um, but you, you know, you didn't really get that immediate, let's see what the images look like. Whereas now you get, there's that immediate, here's the images. You can tell straight away Yeah, to contact the person. It was a landline number. And yep. that was it. There wasn't a mobile phone. You couldn't leave a text message. You go around the house. Yeah, you go around the maybe house. Maybe get murdered. Maybe. Um, you know, and look through, you know, uh, uh, you know, any photo, photo albums, albums that they yeah. actually had. Um, so the process now for starting up a business as a wedding photographer uh, is so much simpler yep. than what it was. And it can be, it's one of the best tools that you can utilize. And as long as you're just, as long as you're not stupid, like you're just aware, this is a tool I can use for business and you use it in the correct way. Yeah. You, you, you can be very, very successful with it. So, yeah. um, there's actually a fantastic, um, a YouTube video. Um, I can't remember the name of the channel, but if you search down the rabbit hole and then I think it's called the Per City Cafe. I'll link it in on YouTube. I'll link it in the description. It's a really okay. interesting, like sort of kind of YouTube documentary. Mm-hmm. And it's about a woman who started a cat cafe in Boston, I think. And a bell. she was nuts. And she basically used the social media to just attack people, but like the work social media okay. to just attack people. She called out people for their sexuality. She called out people for like their, she, she made false claims against charities and and lied about where money had gone and absolutely nuts Lovely like lady. it is the it's firstly it's a very interesting um thing to watch because you it's psychologically it's fascinating but from a learning about how to use facebook point of view it's like the exact thing you should watch yeah like you shouldn't be going on there and talking any shit you shouldn't be going and and i have to really try yeah not with the wedding stuff so much but i find I, I think I'm the absolute archetype of one of those people that they only find their social media when they've got something bad to say. Yeah. Um, and I need to work on that. And I've had to work on that for a long time. And I think that there's a, a, a majority of people that actually are like that. Yeah. Um, so your business should be all positive, no lies necessarily, yeah. but all positive. You know, you're, you're a filter, you're a filter yeah. for positivity and you're making sure that no negativity gets through. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. One of the great things about Facebook, I would say, is uh, the way in which you can use advertising. It's very simple. It's very mm. straightforward. Um, I'd absolutely implore everybody that's going to run an advert on Facebook to not run it on Instagram as well, because what the um, the advertising team at Facebook are great at doing is just sinking a vast majority of your money into nothing adverts on Instagram, yeah. where there's no come back from it. Yeah. You don't get anything back in terms of business from it. You might get some likes if that's what you're interested in, but you can't pay the bills with likes. Yeah. Um, whereas Facebook, you tend to get so much better in terms of the amount of people that see it, the amount of people that react, the amount of people that actually have an interest in booking you for your service. Yeah. Don't have it run through Instagram, have it run purely through Facebook. Yeah. Also, because Instagram is very much a international tool as well. So yes. what you, you know, what potentially you could be advertising or what could be advertised on your behalf could end up in a country that you've got no way of actually getting to. Yeah. And I actually think that like you could argue the same about Facebook. You could argue that Facebook's international, but I think Facebook's, I don't want to say algorithm because I think everyone misuses the word, but I think the way that Facebook is set up is it's a very local for, for the user, everything you kind of Mm. encounter tends to be very local. It's I think why, it's seen and is really an older people's social media. Yeah. Because it's not. Well, because it track it, because it tracks you, you know. Uh, yeah. Let's just be honest here. Yeah. It you knows know, your location. It, it knows, knows your location, so you know, so it, it helps you, you know, what, it, you know, it, it, it measures the, the trigger word, the buzzwords that you use. And, you know, it can yeah. filter through certain things to you. Whereas you don't add a location, I don't think, to Instagram unless you connect the account. You, you know, yeah. there's, there's loads of issues. Um, I would definitely say run stuff through Facebook. Generally as well, people being slightly older on Facebook means they usually have money. Uh, yeah. Young people 
if they do have money, they're usually fucking stupid with it. So <laughs> yeah. um, it's just a really great tool. Yeah. Really easy to use. You can showcase your work, showcase your most recent work and, and you link, can have link the, out from it as well. So yeah. um, link to your website, link to your Instagram. That leads me on. Okay. So I think Instagram's a great place to put up pictures. Yeah. It's actually a great place for existing clients yes. and clients that you've got booked to to be like, or I can't or, wait. Or pushing people that are thinking about it over the edge. Yeah. And actually getting them to book. Yeah. Totally, but not through Instagram. They then come over to Facebook yes. or through email to do it. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about websites mm-hmm. because I think this, I have, I have, I don't want to have, I want to talk forever, but I have something to say about websites. Okay. Um, I think that there's a strategy with websites mm-hmm. that's really missed by all of the photographers that are trying to get their foot on the ladder. Okay. So you have to stop yourself from expanding it before there's enough to fill it. Yeah. So my website for weddings right now is based on storyboards. So individual weddings and a storyboard, a collection of images from that day that makes up a storyboard of what that day was. It gives people not the illusion because I'm not doing anything nefarious, but it gives the illusion of a full wedding day without me having to upload every single picture Yeah, that absolutely no one would care about other yeah. than the people that booked me. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there are personal photos. Yeah. Um, have a gallery of general images. Yep. Don't have storyboards when you're first starting. Yeah. Because if you have storyboards and you have two weddings, the first thing anyone with enough dynamite in their brain to blow their hat off is going to think this person's only shot two weddings. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've got 40 to 50 on my website and people ask us, is that all the weddings you've shot? Yeah. So it's absolutely important that you don't set yourself up because you want to look like how do I describe this? But you, you don't set yourself up to look like you haven't done much. Yeah. You've got to sometimes hide your flaws. I actually used to talk about this on workshops. Um, George Bush. Yeah. Uh, junior, like the, the, yep. the, the second president, the second George Bush. Yeah, George Bush Jr. Fucking idiot. I'm sure not a complete fucking idiot, but an idiot. Mm-hmm. Like did a lot of dumb shit. I'm pretty sure he electrocuted himself by sticking his hand in the socket. He choked on a pretzel. Yeah, he went to war with a country that had nothing, you know. Yeah. He couldn't, he was one of the worst public speakers ever in any office in any part of the world. Yeah. Um. How did he get to be president if he was that much of a fucking idiot? Because he was very good and maybe he had people in place to do it, but he was very good at covering up his past indiscretions. You know, his dubious history with the military yeah his failed oil companies he he was very very good at hiding the mistakes he'd made in the past and only showing the good stuff yeah and that's kind of what we need to to do when you're starting something out yeah so you have a gallery that just showcases a range of images from over the course of the day from however many weddings you've done yeah you only put your best stuff in there yeah so it might only be 20 images, it might only be 30 images, but for the time being, that will do more than you will realise compared yeah. to putting up a storyboard. Yeah. Right? Also, when you first start, you're going to be incredibly weak at, at least one part of the wedding day. Yeah. And showing it in its full, terrible glory is not a good idea. Yeah, I would agree. So you have a gallery, you have some form of about me where you are honest, but not degrading about yourself. Yeah. Where you say that you are an aspiring um, photographer who is incredibly passionate and excited to move into the field of weddings. And yeah. you talk positively about this step forward, but you don't lie about, I photograph 7 billion weddings and I'm a, I'm the goodest. Yeah. You know, like a lot of people try and bullshit with their, with their sort of their bios. Yeah. Be honest, but don't be, so, you know, don't be. Be humble. Be humble, but, but also don't be, don't be mean to yourself. Don't don't have like I've only photographed two weddings. Um, please book me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You, know, don't do you that. can say you know you're 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 a, a talented, exciting photographer who's looking to move into this, and 
the experience you've had so far has been amazing. You love working with couples, blah, blah, blah. You can make yeah. yourself sound really good. I remember I used to do your CV for you. And w- there was one when you'd worked at um, uh, Baker's Oven as one of your leaving school jobs. Like you were at school yeah. and you were doing a part-time job. And you were asking how you make that look good on a CV. And you was you were telling me the jobs you did. And um, one of the things you said was like, oh, we have to do dumb shit like taking the rubbish out. And I was like, cool, sanitation controls manager. Yeah, I remember this. You have to just find a way to reword the truth. Yeah. Not necessarily to lie, but to put a bow on it and dress it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you have your website. For the love of Christ, keep it simple. Yeah. And display the work you want to be doing. Yeah. So if you don't, if you if you're someone that really doesn't like doing group photos in any way, shape, or form, don't have like forty percent of your website of be made up of group photos that you've shot. Yeah, because that's what you'll get asked for. Whatever yeah. you show is what you'll get asked for. Yeah. So have your work be um, a, an arrow towards where you want to end up yeah. for a start, and keep it simple. I, th- this is. Please tell me if I'm wrong here. I really, I, I actually, one of the reasons I decided I had to re-record this and make sure you were here for it. Don't have a website that is like www.chriscarlweddings.wix.com. Please don't. It doesn't look good. .co.uk.com. No dot .wix. No dot, no like dot .squarespace.com. No. Pay the the nominal fee that it costs to be able to have your own domain because it sounds stupid but it doesn't look as legit no it doesn't at all it looks like you're not it looks like to quote alan partridge it looks like you're not quite balls out the bath on it <laughs> it looks like you're not a hundred percent into it you've got one yeah. pant leg in and one pant <laughs> <Yeah>. leg out <laughs> um yeah and, and you're sort of you've just started today yeah, which you don't want. You don't want. You need to make yourself look professional. And then we'll move on to like the last thing. But there's one thing I just add to that website okay. thing. Okay. I would say that um, the work that you put up, even if it's just some from two weddings, make sure that they're finished the same. Don't have them drastically different your style. Consistency yeah. is the sexiest thing in the world. It really is. If you want to make money. Oh, yeah. It's, that, it if you look at any part of capitalism, it's consistency. Yeah. Having a consistent product that people can consistently rely on. They know what they're getting. Some people can decide they don't like it. Some people can decide they love it. Yeah. But consistency. Absolutely on that note, going back to the photographic side of things. In fact, let's just do a quick detour on consistency. Okay. You're editing. Edit and look at it after you've finished editing. Yeah. And think, will this still look good in 10 years? Yes. Am I applying a load of bullshit that's just trendy right now? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's quite common. Those really, really heavy orange to teal mixes to make it look like Mission Impossible 3 might look really good to the Sony users group that you're a member of. But, you know, your client maybe doesn't want to look like a tangerine and in 10 years time, you won't be able to use that work. And it it floating around on the internet might be a major problem for you. Um, Shooting style, obviously, try and be consistent, but that's going to evolve. Your editing will evolve, but in increments. Yeah. this is the last thing. Okay. And I will die on this sword. Oh, shit. <laughs> Please don't call yourself like amazing light <laughs> photography. <laughs> I will never let this go. You won't, no. Don't call yourself something that sounds gimmicky. Just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you might say, oh, but everyone calls themselves like such and such photography. Okay, but it's it's like the most unimportant part. Yeah. And here's a couple of scenarios that I would like people to think about. Okay. Jamila, have you ever had a bad wedding? You ever photographed a wedding and feel like you haven't come away with your best stuff? Yeah. Personally, yeah, to I yourself? Have. Yeah. Okay, I have. Um, I wouldn't want to be sat behind the branding amazing light photography if I felt like I'd just done a really shit job. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would be worried about putting the images forward and so on. I'm not saying insulate yourself from your own shitness, but it's a, it's a hell Don't of a Don't put yourself in that position, to be yeah. honest with you, because people people will say, well, why did you call yourself that? Like, I'm buying into a product here. Yes. And part of that is buying into your name. 
because you are that product. Right. So yeah, make it, make it relevant, make it simple. Just be your name. It doesn't need to be a bunch of yeah. verbs and stuff like that. It can just be, or ad- adjectives, adjectives, sorry. Oh my God, I really went off one. It doesn't need to be a bunch <laughs> of adjectives, sorry. Um, bad brain. Doesn't well, no, there are ones where it's like, I'm, I'm probably shitting on someone here, but there's like finding the light and stuff like that, yeah. which to me, I, I'm pretty sure that's one I know of, just sounds really bible yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, it has, I think people are going to interpret it with different connotations. Whereas if you're like, you know, Jamila Faber. Yeah. I think people are going to figure out yeah. that's your name. And also it's a bit more honest. And I think that where, where videographers, and this is through clients that have booked videographers, they tend to book a company with the company name and then yep. they get a guy. Any person. Yeah. And there'll be like multiple people attached to yep. that videography name, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, but I think with photographers, I don't think it should be the same. I, I think that it should be you as a person. I think the the client should know that when they're booking you. Well, if you're, if you're a single or like us, like a couple or whatever, if you're like a, a very small trading company. Yeah. You know, you're one or two people. There's no point in, in having that kind of expansive name. Yeah. Because what it does is it takes away from the uniqueness of what you are. Yeah. With no real purpose. Yeah. Um, there's one other side to this, which is when, uh, this is videography more than photography, but I have seen it in photography, is when they call themselves like, okay, so let's say like for me, Chris Carl, mm-hmm. let's, let's go with I am KK Media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it doesn't tell me what the fuck you do. Yeah. So are you doing the photo booth? Do you, are you the DJ? You know, so they're watching films all day. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Um. That that's another one that bugs me. Like, keep your branding really clean and simple and consistent. Keep your um. Keep like you say your editing and your shooting style and so on consistent. Yeah. And just build slowly. Don't try and conquer it in one day. Don't try and conquer it after one wedding. Um, one question I do want to ask you, and we'll finish with this exact question. This will be where we're done. Okay. Should people want to get into weddings? Yeah. Why? Because it's it's really fun. And you spend one day with two strangers or a hundred strangers, but essentially two strangers. Um, and you give them a lifetime of memories Mm -hmm. from that. And I think that there is nothing better than making someone else smile, making someone else happy. I just think that's a really, really nice thing to do. And I think that if you can do it and you know, it's something that you can put yourself in, you can put a hundred percent into, then do it. I think it's such a nice job. You know, and it's also one where you don't have to do it five days a week. In most cases, you can't do it five days a week. Yeah. You know, unless you have other people to edit for unless you. Unless you're Ryan Brenizer. Yep, which is absolutely fine. Um, so it means that you can be very flexible with yeah. um your time, which is fantastic for people that have got additional commitments as well to factor into their life. So it's um and it's also a seasonal job in the majority of cases. So yeah. if that's something that appeals to you. That's fantastic. But I just think it's just, it's so fun. You get to meet a whole load of different people. We've met so many nice people. Um, Had a fantastic conversation with a potential client last night. Um, And you just meet people and you're like, oh my God, like we would really get on. Yeah. And you really do get on. Um, And actually you end up in some cases making friends from some of them. Yeah. You know, I've still got a couple of clients on Instagram and on Facebook and every so often, like it's liking posts and there's a comment and stuff or it's happy anniversary or guys, happy birthday. How are your kids getting on? You know? Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, really nice, but it would never have gotten to that, that moment had it not been for the wedding. So yeah, I think people should, I think people should really get into it. I mean, if, it, if it's not your thing, don't do it. Yeah. But I think that, yeah, I, I would encourage people to get into it. It's so much fun. And if it's something that you can do, like we can do it together. Do it. I would say one thing, if you are thinking of doing it and um, it's important to bear in mind that time is a factor. So I'd get started before everyone has coronavirus or is eight foot underwater <laughs> or the world ends in 12 years. Um, 
No, I think it's been all right. I think we covered a lot of stuff. I hope it was helpful and I, informative. If it wasn't, at least we had fun. We did. <laughs> Peace out from fucking Sony users. Woo! <laughs>